Hello, and welcome to a bonus episode of Sam's MCAT Basics. What I'm going to discuss is something that you've probably seen on the news or read in the newspaper. Very recently, a paper was published by a group that was from London, essentially saying that there was the second QR2 HIV in a patient. So what the goals of this podcast are to, number one, go into a bit of background on HIV, um, how it works, and how it's related to this paper. Then I want to discuss the paper and then also discuss the implications of the paper. This topic is very interesting to me, and what I'm hoping is that it ties together some of the topics I've been discussing in these podcasts, a little bit of genetics, a little bit of biochemistry, um, you know, maybe a little bit of research method. So I'm hoping that this all ties together and, you know, this gives you some good information. It's honestly some good information to have of how the study worked. Why, why, are they, why are they able to conclude that this patient is cured and how, how, how did they cure this patient? So I'm going to go through that and uh, hopefully you find this as interesting as I do. So the first thing I want to mention is that this is technically the third cure. The first cure was an anonymous Berlin patient back in 1998. The second cure, which is termed the Berlin patient, was a cure back in 2008. And this this uh, cure is termed, or this patient is termed the London patient, and this is in 2019. And so... Between the second and third cure, which was the Berlin patient and the London patient, there is some basic principles that were kind of held in common for both of these cures. They both, for instance, had some kind of cancer. So for the Berlin patient, they had acute myeloid leukemia, and the London patient had Hodgkin's lymphoma. They also both received stem cell transplants from donors with CCR5 mutations. So I'll get, I'll get into what that means. And one thing I, th- I think it's very important to note before we start talking about some background info into HIV is that um, it's, they call this a cure. However, it's, it's more, more accurate to call it a sustained remission. I mean, the paper is even titled a, uh, a remission. And that's because you, you don't know if HIV is lurking in some of these cells in very small and measurable amounts, um, you know, maybe in another 20 years one of these patients will have a reoccurrence of the virus. Um, you know, we just don't know. So a lot of, I think a lot of scientists are a little hesitant. I think a lot of them are calling it more of a long-term remission than necessarily a cure. However, here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer to it as a cure. All right, so let's get into some background that you're going to need to know to be able to understand how this cure works. So HIV is a retrovirus which means it is a single-stranded RNA virus. And what it does is it uses a reverse transcriptase in order to convert that RNA then to DNA. Then it integrates this DNA into the host cell genome using a protein known as an integrase. And so then these host cells that harbor the HIV proviral DNA then transcribe and translate those genes into viral um, protein, which then can be assembled and the virus could escape and then infect more cells and the cycle goes on. However, these viruses can remain dormant in cells for long periods of time. And so these cells that are dormant and contain some kind of proviral DNA or DNA from the virus that is integrated into the host cell genome make up what's called the latent reservoir. And so the latent reservoir contains all of these cells that contain DNA from the virus integrated into their genome, but are not actively transcribing any of these viral genes. So they're not making any viruses. The virus is essentially just hanging out in the host genome, floating around with the cell and just sticking around, basically being silent and not doing anything. And so these cells that make up the latent reservoir have a very long half-life. They live for a long time. They have a half-life of 44 months. So if you do the math, you'll see that if you want to completely eradicate the latent reservoir, you would need about 60 years for these cells to all die out. So it's a long, it's a long time, very long time. So HIV 
typically infects CD4 positive T cells, also called helper T cells. And they're CD4 positive because they express the CD4 receptor on the surface of the cells. So I think the most important thing to know in terms of background for how HIV works is how the virus enters the cell. So I'm going to break this down into a few steps. But HIV entry first begins with the adhesion of the virus to an immune cell, let's say a CD4 positive T cell in this case. And so the first step then is that the envelope protein of the virus binds to the cell surface, and this is typically nonspecific. And this brings HIV, this brings the HIV virus into close proximity with a viral receptor, which is the CD4. Remember again that I'm talking about the CD4 positive T cell, so that is the receptor that the virus uses, the CD4 receptor. So then next, the envelope protein then binds to the host cell and using the CD4 receptor, and this causes a conformational change within the envelope protein that helps it bind to a co-receptor. And this is the really thing to pay attention to for the cure. So once that conformational change happens, the HIV then binds to the co-receptor. And so there's two main kinds of co-receptors. The first is CCR5, and the second is CXCR4. And the HIV virus must bind on to these co-receptors in order to enter the cell. And so it's important to note here that viruses that prefer to use the CCR5 co-receptor are called the CCR5 tropic viruses. And then on the other hand, viruses that use the CCXCR4 co-receptor are called CXCR4 tropic. So that's, that's to say, in other words, that viruses either prefer to use the CCR5 co-receptor or they prefer to use the CXCR4 co-receptor. And in terms of prevalence, the CCR5 tropic viruses are a bit more common than the CXCR4 tropic viruses. And people infected with HIV can have any mixture of um, tropism. So they can be only CCR5 tropic, or they could be a mixture of CXCR4 and CCR5, or they could be CXCR4. So that's to say that they could be infected with a, a three different combinations of viruses, right? Viruses that use this one co-receptor, viruses that use both co-receptors, and this is going to be a mixture of two different uh, virus phenotypes, right? Um, a virus isn't tropic for both, right? You, virus is tropic for one. So you'd have to have a mixture of two different viruses. But that's important to keep in mind, right? Viruses prefer one of these types of co-receptors and a patient can have any mixture of these different um, tropisms. All right, so going back to how the HIV virus enters cells. So we've gotten to the point where we bind to the CD4 receptor that causes a conformational change in the envelope protein, which then binds the co-receptor. So then after that, the fourth step in the process is that the virus migrates to a place where membrane fusion can occur. So once it's migrated, the fifth step occurs in which the virus enters the cell when the membrane of the virus fuses with the cell membrane. And part of what makes this possible is the binding of the co-receptor. So this binding exposes hydrophobic GP41 fusion peptide that is on the envelope protein, and this helps the virus fuse to the membrane of the host cell. And once that fusion occurs, the virus is then delivered into the cell. So let me just quickly recap this process. So the first thing that happens is that the HIV-1 virus binds to the CD4 receptor. Once that occurs, the virus then also binds onto the co-receptor. There's two different kinds of co-receptors, and virus tropism determines which co-receptor is used. Once that co-receptor is bound, then this virus moves to a place where it can then fuse with the host cell membrane, and then fusion occurs, and the virus is dumped into the cell. All right, so that brief bit of knowledge is all I think you really need to know to be able, able to understand how this cure works. So let's get on to the paper. So 
The patient that was cured in this case is called the London patient. And this patient was diagnosed with HIV in 2003. And when they were diagnosed, um, they had a viral load that was measured to be 180,000 copies per milliliter. To put this into perspective, a low viral load is considered about 100 copies per milliliter. So they had a very high amount of virus in their blood. And at this point, they were given a three-drug antiretroviral regimen, which is pretty standard. It's also called ART, which is antiretroviral therapy. So yeah, you may see that abbreviated as ART in this paper. And then in, in 2012, the patient was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And part of this process, they went through chemotherapy and the regimen, the ART regimen was switched back and forth a few times. And then complete remission was achieved for this patient in 2016. And as part of the treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma, this patient was given a hemopoietic stem cell transplant. And so the reason this works is because um, they essentially help rebuild the immune system as the cells are being killed by chemotherapy or radiation, etc. The stem cell transplant given to this patient was an allographic stem cell transplant, meaning that the stem cells came from a donor. There's also autologous stem cell implants, which is where they take your own cells from your body and then um, re-inject you with them. But in this case, the stem cells were from a donor. And so one thing you have to consider when anytime you're giving a stem cell implant from someone else is you need to make sure that the human leukocyte antigen or HLA type is the same. So if not, your body will essentially reject the transplant, which is bad, obviously. So you need to make sure the HLA type is the same in order for that donor to be able to implant. So in the case of the London patient, they received the stem cell implant from a donor that was HLA, HLA-B, which was matching them. And this donor, interestingly, had a homozygous recessive mutation in the CCR5 gene. This mutation is a 32 base pair deletion in the CCR5 gene that results in a non-functional CCR5 protein. In other words, this deletion actually makes this co-receptor not work. And I want to make it clear, this donor was selected because they had this CCR5 mutation. It's not like this donor accidentally had this mutation and then, you know, they gave the patient this stem cell transplant and they're like, oh my gosh, look what happened. We cured this patient of HIV. They knew what they were doing. So they looked back, obviously, at the first cure. And this is basically the same thing that happened in the first cure. So they knew what they were doing. So then going back to how HIV enters a cell, you know, what happens now to this CCR5 tropic virus that wants to enter the cell? Well, it, it can't. It's completely blocked, right? It tries to bind to this co-receptor that it needs to enter the cell, and it can't. All right, so going back to the London patient. So this patient received an allographic hemo hematopoietic stem cell transplant from this donor, and at day 30 they became 100% donor chimeric. And in other words, this patient's genotype in these lymphocytes, including CD4 T cells, in which HIV infects, changed, right? So these cells changed from CCR5 homozygous wild type, completely functional CCR5 co-receptor proteins being produced, to a CCR5 homozygous recessive pheno uh, genotype. Right, So essentially they went from being able to produce the CCR5 protein to not being able to produce a functional CCR5 protein. So what happened to the patient? Did that eradicate the HIV virus from their body? Well, the patient was kept on the antiretroviral therapy regimen for 515 days after this stem cell transplant and that was till September 2017, and then they were taken off the antiretroviral therapy. And so far, between September 2017 and now, there has been no evidence of any virus produced either in the plasma, 
in the CD4 T cell populations. They've done viral, viral outgrowth assays to try to see if there's any latent reservoir hanging around. And so far, it doesn't look like there's anything. So it's been, what, 18 months? And there has, it's looked like a functional cure. It's, it's very cool, right? So what happened was they essentially replaced all these cells that were expressing the CCR5 protein and they replaced them with cells that had mutations in the CCR5 gene that can no longer produce that co-receptor. And so it's important to note that when scientists looked at this virus, they were able to say that the London patient was infected with a CCR5 tropic virus. So what are the implications? Well, first of all, it's, it's great that it looks like there is a possibility for a cure or if not a cure, a long-term remission, right? For a long time, scientists, scientists weren't even sure that a cure was possible. Um, they thought these cells might just become infected and there's nothing we could do about them for, and they would just hang out in the body forever. So it shows a proof of concept in terms of a cure. And right now in your head, what I hope you're thinking is, well, what about CXCR4 tropic viruses? Wouldn't they just be able to escape around this? They use a different co-receptor to enter the cell. And the answer to that is yes. As I mentioned a bit ago, scientists were able to figure out that this London patient had a CCR5 tropic virus. So in, if, a, if a patient had a CXCR4 tropic virus, it would 100% be able to um, bind to that CXCR4 co-receptor and it would still be able to enter cells. And we have actually seen that in some of the cases in which we've tried this and it's failed. So that's important to note here is that this this exact treatment that was given in this instance would not apply to anyone that had a CXCR4 tropic virus. It's also important to note that this has been tried multiple times before and failed a lot of times and you know it's no one's really been able to say why that is. So it appears there's a bit of variability with this treatment and um, there's still some stuff to figure out there. Also you know this is an expensive treatment and you have to be you have to find a very specific donor right you have to find somebody that matches your hla and you have to find somebody who has that ccr5 mutation and so finding that for everybody who has hiv and being able to pay for that is something that is somewhat of a barrier to this being a cure for everyone however something that's kind of interesting is that this suggests that we could use newer technology, something like CRISPR, to edit this gene in you know, some stem cells from a donor that just matches your HLA, and then we could inject you with those cells. And this might be a cheaper, easier way to go about this cure. And so just to put everything into context, a kind of a takeaway, for me at least, is to be cautiously optimistic. So this could lead to a less expensive treatment, right? And um, eventually maybe using CRISPR we can get there. But for now, it gives us a better understanding of how HIV works. It gives us an understanding that a cure can, in, uh, in concept, work. And, you know, this just gets us one step closer to finding a cure that works for everybody for HIV. Thanks for listening to this bonus episode of Sam's MCAT Basics. If you like this podcast, if you like the podcast, please go rate in on iTunes. Um, if you know you have any comments or anything you really want to see in these upcoming podcasts, please shoot me an email. My email is attached to the show notes. Um, the next podcast will be talking about the endocrine system. I'll get into a little bit of physiology. Um, hopefully it'll be helpful in your studies. Thanks again for listening.